Good evening. My name is Drew Thompson. Um, I am an associate professor of visual culture and black studies here at the Bard Graduate Center. I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming, welcoming you this evening to the final installment of the spring 2023 faculty and focus series. Before I begin my formal introductions of tonight's event and speaker, I would like to express my gratitude to the Office of Public Humanities and Research, Andrew Kircher, Laura Mensky, and Nadia Rivers, who have been unbelievable in their support of conceiving and organizing and hosting this series. I also wish to thank uh, Peter Miller, the Dean of the Faculty, for creating this opportunity to share and develop faculty research. And finally, I'm really grateful to the faculty and students of the BART Graduate Center who have um, continually attended these events, even when it's a busy time of the semester. And I must say there is no extra credit for the students filling the seats. Over the course of the last few months, I've had the unique opportunity with invited guests ranging from theorists to artists to writers to explore Polaroids as objects of Black material culture. What has become apparent is that layered within the Polaroid films and cameras are complex histories of representation, incarceration, surveillance, and activism. Pivotal to the history of Polaroids as objects of Black material culture is the Polaroid Revolutionary Workers' Movement. The PRWM organized an international boycott against the Polaroid Corporation for its business dealings in South Africa. The, the protest movement was one of the first anti-apartheid boycott movements in the United States, and through public mobilization succeeded in forcing the Polaroid Corporation to cease business activity in South Africa. As the art historian Krista Thompson writes, and I quote, through the PRWM, an emergent form of Black revolutionary politics was attached to a photography company and to recognition of the uses of photography to suppress Black rights, end quote. This evening, we are pleased to have Caroline Hunter, one of the group's co-founders and co-leaders, who will speak about the PRWM activities this evening. Caroline Hunter grew up in Louisiana at the time of segregation and studied chemistry at Xavier University. After graduating with a degree in chemistry, she took a job as a chemist um, at the Polaroid Corporation. In October 1970, she and her late partner and husband, Ken Williams, launched the Polaroid Revolutionary Workers Movement. The year the year later, she would be fired, but continued her community organization until the late 1970s in her local Cambridge community. In the early 1980s, she worked as a public school math teacher and later assistant pr principal in Cambridge public, high, uh, public school system. She also played an outside role in state privacy um, state policy regarding privacy in Massachusetts by serving on a governor appointed committee. For her community and international activism, she is the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2011 Louise Gaskin Lifetime Civil Rights Award from the Massachusetts Teacher Association, the 2012 Rosa Parks Memorial Award, and the 2014 David, uh, Dr. Effie Jones Humanitarian Award from the American Association of School Educators. I would be remiss if I did not mention that Caroline is a member of the Polar Bear Association. Yes. <laughs> the house right and, and leads Water Aerobics in Martha's Vineyard, to which you are all invited to. And just in the last year, won a seat on the Cambridge School Committee. So please join me in welcoming Caroline Hunter this evening. <laughs> Good evening, thank you, Drew. And I also want to take, thank the BGC team, um, Andrew, Nadia, and Laura for the hospitality, and Drew for inviting me and acknowledging my work. This is my story, and it starts in high school. And so a lot of this, of course, is reflective. Um, Maybe you can figure out which one I am as I talk. What is a picture, a photograph? By definition, a photograph is a picture made using a camera in which the image is focused onto film or other light sensitive material 
and then made visible and permanent by chemical treatment and stored digitally. A photograph is an artifact. It can be art, or the art of, or the art to photograph. It's a noun that is easily adapted into a verb. It captures a moment in time, is artistically described by Anissa Ramirez in her research of the work, as she talks about the effort to capture the image of a galloping horse to settle a bet of a rich man who was convinced that horses defied gravity as they left the track while trotting. The photograph preserves what is taken in a moment in time, the incident of capture for us to see, to review, to examine, to exhibit, to share, and to purpose. The photograph is a document of the moment of the incident of your capture of your image, with or without your agency, sometimes with or without your knowledge, and with or without your permission. Or it can be taken under force of law where your image can and will be used against you as a matter of life and death. What about the picture in a minute? What memories was it forced to capture? What memories of capture did it inspire and did it document? I'm Caroline Hunter, I'm a history maker, and my story is in the United States Library of Congress. I am a primary source. My life's activism is a reference book on grassroots organizing and coalition building. I co-founded the PRWM, Polaroid Revolutionary Workers Movement, the first corporate workers protest against a multinational corporation doing business in South Africa in 1970. The PRWM inspired and galvanized the African-American community into a pan-African action against apartheid. Today, I'll present the story of our development. This is the story of the power of the people, two ordinary black workers who created an international boycott through a grassroots movement that changed American foreign policy, helped free Nelson Mandela, and helped end apartheid. My story is about a good book, the impact of a great teacher, and a strong family foundation. This is a picture taken I'm the little one, I'm two years old. It was taken in 1948 at the Perrault Studios. And I didn't know much about the Perrault Studios, but I had to research them for this. One of the only 101 African-American women identified in 1920 US Census as a photographer was Florestine Perrault Collins, Google her. She transformed what began as a portrait studio in her living room into an unrivaled legacy of authentic expression that defied the oppressive racial and gender barriers of her time. Born into a large Creole family, she's Collins at the time, Perrault began working as a photographer at the age of 14 to help alleviate her family's debt problems through Jim Crow era racism forced her to hide her racial identity and troubling New Orleans tradition of passing for white. So she passed for white. She worked as an assistant to white photographers until as a capable entrepreneur, she grew her business from portraits of family and friends to become a photographer renowned for capturing subjects ranging from weddings to high school graduations to visits from soldiers from World War II. While always true to her craft, Collins sought to enhance her subject's natural beauty and sensuality in images that stand in stark contrast to the period's prevailing stereotypes. So even though we were poor, my parents took us to the studio, to Perrault's studio, to have our picture taken. We have another one of my younger brother at the studio. And this one, um, I think we kind of messed with them. So my sister Joan, she didn't have an eye. And so I took it to a reproductive studio, and they switched. They re reconstructed it. I have another one that I think I was the culprit on. It's a picture with Santa Claus, and everybody has a mustache but me. I don't, I don't know about that, but that, that could have been the case. I went to uh, Catholic high school, and I was a bit of a nerd. And in 10th grade, a rare 
white lay teacher in our Catholic school, Mr. Valder, introduced us to Cry to Beloved Country. I was so moved by the book that this is my 10th grade math book, and that's the quote that I wrote in the book. And I used to recite to people. I probably was a very boring child. There's a man lying in the grass, and there's a storm gathering over his head, and people pass him by not knowing what's going to happen. They do not disturb him. On the bottom of that page is, is another quote from, Cry, from Crime and Punishment, which is a thousand-page novel by Dostoevsky. That's 10th grade me. The rest of the book has little love stories and poems and things that a 10th grader would do. And then I put that aside and went on with my life. Here I am in 1964. I'm graduating Xavier Preparatory High School. And I want to tell you that because I grew up under segregation, and for many of you, it's hard if you're not in my age group, if you didn't grow up in the South, to know how pervasive it was. It was America's apartheid. But under segregation, we had black everything. Black doctors, black nurses, black lawyers, black businesses, black pharmacists. And integration destroyed a little bit of that. Here I am graduating from Xavier University. I have a degree in bachelor's in chemistry. And I'm looking for a job. And I have three recruiting opportunities, one in the oil and gas industry in Louisiana, one at Hoffman La Roach, a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey, and one at Polaroid and I took the job at Polaroid Corporation. At Polaroid, I was a research scientist in the color labs. Uh, color is gonna play a double entendre in this story throughout. And it's very ironic because Polaroid's business is color photography. And when I worked at Polaroid, it was a great opportunity. I'm a first generation college graduate. I left my home in New Orleans and came to Cambridge, Mass. I had no relatives. My nearest relative was 1,500 miles away, but I thought the bird had to kind of fall out of the nest to figure out what was going on. And in my course at Polaroid, one day, myself and Ken Williams, who was a colleague at the time, looked around at a bulletin board and saw an ID card, just like your driver's license. But it had the face of one of his colleagues from his shop, the photographic group. But his name wasn't there. He had an African name. And below his name was Union of the Mines. And below that was Department of South Africa. And we picked it up. I wish we were thieves. I'd have it to show you, but we weren't thieves. We picked it up and looked at it, and Ken said, I didn't know Polaroid was in South Africa. Because Polaroid had a reputation of being a liberal company. You could see the vice president and say, hey, Joe. He'd say, hey, Caroline, how you doing today? But it was non-union. But it had good benefits. You could get funds to continue your education. You could bid up on jobs. And so my response to him when he said, I didn't know they were in South Africa, everything I learned in 10th grade came back to me. Mr. Balda was there with me. And I said, I didn't know they were in South Africa, but I know that's a bad place for black people. And we researched in, for those of you who are old enough, the encyclopedias. We went to the library. And we found out that Polaroid was making the photographs for passbooks in apartheid South Africa. And because Ken was in the corporate space and he knew these guys, he could ask around. So the first response is, of course, that's not true. I don't believe you. I've been in forever, I didn't know that. Because it was a corporate secret. Carefully kept so Polaroid could cultivate this image of this picture in a minute for you to take your family photographs of to share your experiences. And then, of course, it's an old rumor, which means it came up before. And then on the other side, well, where did you hear that? Who spilled the beans? 
Maybe somebody wasn't supposed to leave that ID card around. Or what's that got to do with you that's 10,000 miles away? It's just a small percentage of our business. Well, what's 1% of a billion dollars? Don't bother, you have a job. Mind your business. So we talked among ourselves with other Polaroid workers. We decided there was something we needed to address. And so we thought, well, why don't we make a leaflet? I think that's October 7th. Polaroid at prisons of black people in 60 seconds. We use the marketing and advertisement against them. And on a, we found the place to put this leaf, to produce this leaflet. And on a Saturday morning, we go into my shop, we sign in, we use our Polaroid ID work cards to get in. And we carefully put this leaflet up on all the bulletin boards, neatly, okay? All over the lab all the floors, and on the way out, we sign out, and on the way out, I said, let's put them where the corporate people park, because they park behind the building, and we did, and we went home. On Monday, when we got to work, the Polaroid police and the Cambridge police were there to greet us, and they had a conversation, what should we do, you know, because seize the time was dangerous rhetoric back then, that's the Black Panthers, so they're a little concerned, and we were allowed to go on to work. Many of my colleagues were very angry at me because they, they didn't believe it. I've worked here 40 years. How come I don't know this? So after we put out our leaflet, this is Polaroid stationery where the Polaroid lawyer says, well, everybody, we didn't sell it to the apartheid government. We sold it to the military. Well, what's the military in a police state? And everybody in South Africa carries an ID card. So we counter that with a leaflet that says that's not true. Whites, Asians who are honorary whites because of the business with South Africa, carry an ID card. Everybody else carries a 60-page passbook document. So there's another memo that's an amendment to this one that was put on. We had a little dialogue going on. So we decide, we locate Chris and Teta who is a South African divinity student who risked his life to be with us because he had just gone here with his young family to study at the divinity school. So Chris is on the far end and he's saying, it's true. I had my picture taken with a Polaroid camera for my pass book, Dom Pass. Dom Pass means dumb pass, that's what Africans call it, for my Dom Pass photo. And so the night before this, we were alerted by the community that Polaroid had replaced all of the cab drivers in Tech Square with police and FBI agents, and they were gonna have snipers on the roof. So instead of having our rally in the open space of Tech Square, we had to put it under the trees. My first memory of South Africa was in 1960 when I was in high school, just in high school. The Shawsville Massacre, we watched it on TV, on a black and white TV where blacks decided, as they're about to extend the past to women and other people, we're gonna protest this passbook nonviolently and prove that we intend to be nonviolent. We're showing up with our women and children. 69 people were slaughtered and massacred. No one did anything. Back to the rally. And because we were Polaroid workers, after the rally, we made an arrangement to meet with the corporation. They sent the first vice president of international sales, Arthur Barnes, and we presented our demands on Polaroid stationery because we were Polaroid employees. And in our naivete, we thought there would be a conversation. Ken was fired that day. The three demands are that Polaroid denounce apartheid, simultaneously in the U.S. and in South Africa. Because Chris and Ted had told us that American corporations doing business in South Africa stand on this side and say, oh, we hate apartheid, and go on this side and make the deal. The second demand is that Polaroid stop doing business in South Africa. And the third demand, that Polaroid turn, turn over all profits earned in South Africa 
to the recognized liberation movements fighting for their freedom because now, by this time, the ANC is exiled and they're fighting for their freedom. This is a passbook. It looks like your, your, uh, it's the size of your passport. 60 page document with everything about you. It has to be on your person at all times. This gathering would not have been able to happen in South Africa. This would be illegal. No meetings of whites and blacks together. But if the police came in and my pass is over here and not on my purse, I can be arrested. And when I'm arrested, I can be fined. I can be imprisoned. I can be whipped or beaten or I might die. This is one of the leaflets that Ken produced. This was the Sharpsville massacre and Polaroid was there. No more needed to be said. After some time of organizing, we re and as we organized, we would have community meetings. And as more and more black workers came out to join us, to support us, the next day when they got to work, they were called in on the carpet. Because Polaroid made a point of hiring you, but they'd hire your cousin and your uncle and your brother. So they'd call you in and they say, Caroline, well, you know, you were seen at that meeting and it'd be very difficult for you to keep your job if you continue to be with those people. And it'll be very difficult for everybody else in your family to keep their job. So at one point we realized that the people who were working with us were still in jeopardy. Ken was fired because I was professional. I was still allowed to work, but I was closely monitored as I went from building to building. Some people would not eat with me or were afraid to associate with me because the truth is difficult to bear. So on October 27, we called the press conference and we called for an international boycott of all Polaroid products. Because that's what the oppressed South Africans were asking us to do, to isolate South Africa so that they could win their freedom. And we figured this is David and Goliath, the least we could do is throw a rock. This is a leaflet produced by colleagues in England because we joined the vibrant anti-apartheid movement that already existed. Americans were late to this party. And they produced the photograph for us, and of course, Ken put the rest together. And this is Polaroid's main advertising. It is like opening a present. But this one will cost you your life. Under the past laws, more than 80% of Africans have been stopped and imprisoned or fined for violations of past laws. And it's probably conservative because anyone could stop you. Any person above your class could stop you and demand your pass. Polaroid, because they were into cultivating their own image, as opposed to doing what's right, they took out this ad. They really helped us a lot. Because we were trying to spread the word and so they took out this ad in all the major newspapers. I think it has a date. Day after Thanksgiving, so everybody's home reading the paper. What is Polaroid doing in South Africa? We knew. They were like, are we in South Africa? Did somebody sell it to them? Are we really doing that? So let's put up a study group so we can see what we're doing. Little insight. Polaroid was founded in 1937. In 1938, they opened their first distributorship in South Africa, which if you understand World War II and understand history, South Africa was pro-Nazi during the Second World War. Now, prior to our campaign, the black community under the Black United Front had sent out a corporate plan, a corporate plea to all of the corporations in the Massachusetts area saying, Instead of going through the United Appeal, which takes the money and trickles down to black communities, why don't you give the money directly to us? Polaroid sent a letter saying, no, we're not going to give you any money. But after we started our boycott campaign, they sent the Black United Front a $20,000 check. Well, because we were active in the community and we appeared on many uh, talk shows and radio shows in the, in the black community, we had YLD Radio, which was a black talk show. 
uh, which was really the voice of the community. And we had support. The Black United Front said, well, we got this check, but we support this campaign. So we're going to have a community meeting to decide what to do with the money. So Ken is on the outside. The gentleman in the middle is from uh, the um, Black United Front. And the gentleman on the end is a Polaroid employee who's an apologist for the corporation. So we have this community meeting. I think Chris and Teta spoke as well. And the black community voted. We're going to keep the money, but we're sending $10,000 to Cairo, Illinois. If you don't understand the racial stripe in America, black people in Cairo, Illinois were fighting an embattled white community. So they sent $10,000 to them. And they said the other $10,000 to the liberation movements fighting for their freedom through the United Nations. So the black community was solidly behind us. And the civil rights movement and anti-apartheid movement were one of the two that were led by African Americans. This is from Ben Scott. He said, how can we preach that others should boycott? when we have an opportunity to do the same. And there were editorials for and against this position, but the position was firm. So a little bit of egg on the face, Polaroid. The bribe did not work. This is uh, our button. I have one. We produce, uh, when I go into the schools, I can't really show it anymore. But, uh, but we produced this as a button. Uh, and we also had leaflets and posters. And we were serious. No bullshit. We were very serious. One of the first people who came to our support was Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory appeared with us on a radio show where we had an anonymous Polaroid worker, corporate worker, who was there to talk about the fact that he was supporting the Polaroid boycott, and he had a no bullshit sticker on his briefcase, and he would go to work every day with it. And so he appeared on this radio talk show with us as an anonymous person, and his brother-in-law outed him. His brother-in-law, who worked for Polaroid, called and told Polaroid who it was. And so Polaroid contacted the worker, and Dick Gregory, and said, Edwin Lane wants to meet with you. And Dick Gregory said, well, Ken's coming along. And they said, well, we're not going to meet with Ken. So Dick Gregory said, I'm not meeting with you. I'm putting my Polaroid camera under the bed. I'm not taking it out until you get out of South Africa. Support from the black community. And support for Dick Gregory was a very important uh, person in our community, not just a comedian, but a serious activist. So Polaroid says, well, let's study the situation, even though we've been in South Africa since 1938. And, and, and the apartheid laws were developed in 1948, just when we introduced our film. Let's go and see what the black people in South Africa have to say about this. Because we didn't know we were doing this business, but now we know. Let's go and we're going to do this little study group. So this is a typical corporate government tactic when you raise an issue. Let's study it first. We're going to bring in experts who we trust. We're going to brainwash the committee. We have a committee of corporate people and regular working people who know nothing about South Africa. We're going to bombard them with information. And they're going to say, well, we can't talk to the black people of South Africa. Let's go over there and see what's going on. So they send over two whites and two blacks. The two blacks, one's a, a, a middle management. The other one is on the employees committee, which is a uh, an attempt to avoid unionization because employees decide of employees' cases. And when you get off the employees' committee, you get a better job, but nobody pays attention to that. And the other person was the vice president of international sales who sold the ID system to South Africa, Tom Wyman. And so, but what do they call them? Past camera bosses. Now, if you don't know, it is against the law in South Africa to say you hate apartheid. It's against the law in South Africa to say boycott. It's against the law in South Africa to protest. So what can the people say? But they come back and they say, oh, we're going to do something for South Africa. South Africa is a police state.
So Polaroid says, we're going to do the experiment in South Africa. We're going to raise the wages of our black workers. We're going to set up a scholarship fund. And we're going to do right. But what do they say in South Africa? Don't come in with this holier than now attitude. You've been making money. You go over there and you pretend you're good, but you like being over here with us. Profits are good. And then the minister says, I don't care what they say, no black will ever supervise a white, no black will ever have a job that a white person has. So why did we say denounce apartheid simultaneously here in South Africa? Because we knew about double speak. So lots of coverage in the newspaper an experiment with human lives. So this is another interesting thing. Um, Ken Williams had a speaking event in DC with the Black Jaguars in Federal City. I did not go. And with that group, he went to try to see the Black Caucus with some of the brothers. And when they get to the uh, Black Caucus, they're having a meeting. And the secretary says, goes into Congressman uh, Diggs. He says, Congressman Diggs, I have these people out here. They have something very important to tell you. So Diggs says, I'm sorry. We just started this meeting. We can't meet with them. So she goes out to talk to Ken. And Ken was a little insistent. He wouldn't leave. So she goes back into the meeting, and I have this because I have footage of someone who's making a film about the great Congressman Ron Dellums. And I was able to listen to six hours of footage of this interview. And Ron Dellums talks about this in his interview. And so Dick says, Dellums was a new guy. He's the kid. He says, Dellums, you go. Send the young guy out to meet with him. And John Conyers went with him. And they did not know of Polaroid's business in South Africa, although they were critical of corporations doing business in South Africa. But they didn't know that Polaroid was critical to the infrastructure, to the survival of South Africa, to the death of black people. And Congressman, Congressman Dellums at that point craft, drafted legislation, which he filed for 15 years, until on a fluke he got a vote, 15 years later, the vote sanctions against South Africa. And in the footage that I have interviewed, was able to review, he says he's sitting on a podium watching Nelson Mandela give his speech, and he remembers how the black workers changed his life. These are some of our leaflets. Um, when we started our protests, we were in the height of the Vietnam um, protests in this country in the 70s. And science for the people existed already. These were scientists and chemists and physicists who said, you can't be against the law, against the war, and work on the trigger to the bomb. You can't be against the war in Vietnam and work on the components of napalm. You have to stand up. So they supported us and they embraced us. And because Edwin Land, because of student protests around our boycott, was not allowed to speak in many spaces where he'd go to speak and the students would say, well, before you talk about that color film, can you talk about those past books in South Africa? And because he was not allowed to speak, his peers, the International Association of American Chemists and Physicists, big organization, invited him to speak in New York. And so I took a day off from work, a personal day, where you're off from work and you're not sick. Ken was already fired, so he didn't have to take a day off. And we go to New York, and we participate in the teach-in. And then the next day, we take over the stage. Edwin Land is in the audience. He's about to give a great speech. Uh, and various people speak. I'm just holding a sign. Ken speaks. I Rubens, all some of the people speak. And at first, the audience is catcalling and booing, but eventually they listen, and they applaud, and we get off the stage. To tell you how big this was, Edwin Teller, the father of the A-bomb, is the MC. So you know who's in the room. And Lan is spastic. They didn't take time to tell him to calm down. 
he's, he's out of control. He says, all they want is a bloodbath in South Africa, which is what South Africans say. That's what the government says. Why hire 900 black people after King got killed? So what? So the very next week, at the very same hour, I am brought in and given my letter of suspension. Misconduct. But the day after the protests, we testified the United Nations Special Committee on Apartheid. So in the lineup, that's me, that's Ken, that's Robert Van Lierup, filmmaker, photographer, activist, Aluta Continua, and many other films, Jennifer Davis and George Hauser. The United Nations welcomed us with open arms because prior to this, it was an intellectual conversation against apartheid. And now you have some action. Uh, and of course, after this position, the press interviews me, Ms. Hunter, you feel your job's jeopardy? Oh, no, I'm on a personal day. I'm exercising my rights of free speech. They talk to Polaroid. Oh, no, Ms. Hunter's exercising the right to free speech. A week later, I get my letter. Now, when I got fired, the UN had a special hearing on the firing of Caroline Hunter. The special, that's another um, news article. That's my letter of firing, my vituperative actions causing stress in the company that employs me. I'm fired for misconduct detrimental to the best interests of a corporation organizing an international boycott, an honor which I hold dear. This is one of our many leaflets. There's Land on his own ID card. And this is a phrase from Edward Land himself. Polaroid is on its way to lead the world. Perhaps to save it by the intersection of science, technology, and real people. I wonder which real people he's talking about. And Edwin Land basically said, they picked us. We, we have to stand on the battle line for the rest of the 350 multinational corporations earning a great profit in South Africa. Uh, so this is some of the protests. That's a tag on the building. That's the Edwin Land Science Center. He never put his name on it because he didn't want that to continue to happen. But it did happen. And then this uh, Pan-Africanism sparked African Liberation Movement days and all kinds of protests on and on. We also talked about, we started the divestment movement. We asked churches and organizations to pull out their stocks out of Polaroid. This is where we got proxies to go to a meeting. Ken dressed up, he put on a shirt and tie, but they wouldn't let us in. But we had people in there raising the point from the floor as shareholders saying, I protest your business in South Africa. This is just a little um, note from um, Jim Hoagland basically saying prior to this, it was an intellectual conversation, but our agency was the fact that we were Polaroid workers, that we were the first ones within um, a corporation. He said another bleeding heart liberal is pre pretty easy to shake off along with Wall Street, but a black American starts with an automatic credibility. And perhaps somebody from segregation has a little bit of better credibility. This speaks for itself. What are you willing to stand for and stand up against? Legality is not a matter of, legality is a matter of power. It has nothing to do with justice. And now we have new laws that are making being trans, being female, being indigenous, illegal. This picture was taken at a celebration after Mandela appeared in Boston. And interestingly enough, Winnie Mandela, who had a social work degree, who protested vigorously while Nelson was in jail, who was in prison for talking about a chicken with a neighbor, who was harassed and brutalized while he was in prison, she was working at Polaroid assembling sunglasses. Ken, unfortunately, didn't get in this picture. He's trying to take the picture. He's fumbling with his camera. 
she says to me, you got me fired. I said, no, you got me fired, and that's why we're, we're laughing. And this is Mandela's tribute to us and to Massachusetts. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, um, maybe just to get us started or warmed up, did you or your family ever have phone rooms or use them? No, I have, when I look back, I had very few of them. And I think it was an economic situation. And also, I think it's generational. Mm -hmm. um, so I had very few of them because we were we went to the studio. We had those little brownie cameras, you know. So no, and even in my personal collection, very few of them. Did your parents ever buy their own camera for you all to take them, or was it always that you relied on? No, we we had little brownie cameras to to take pictures. But you know, you send the film out, you wait to get it back. And I think the popularity of Polaroid is what they advertise. You can see it right away. You have control of the image. You don't have to send it out. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened to the parole studio, did you, and how often would you all go? I don't know. I know I have that one. I know we have one of my brother, the little kid on the, in the white clothes on the, on the piano stool. Uh, so I don't know, because as I said, someone messed with those pictures. I don't know who it was. It was you? I, I put the mustaches on everybody, I'm sure, because I didn't put one on me, but, you know, but they, we handled pictures, you know, you play with the family album, you go through the pictures and you reminisce, so I'm kind of the family historian, so I started gathering this much after, as an adult, trying to preserve these pictures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process of your getting the job at the Polaroid Corporation. Mm -hmm. You were presented with these great choices, how did you arrive at the Polaroid mm -hmm. Corporation? And maybe for audiences to just have a little bit more context, what was your day-to-day -day job like yeah. at the Polaroid mm -hmm. Corporation? Uh, well, um, I don't remember specific counseling. You know, it was just do the best you can at Xavier, go get a job. You know, you got to work twice as hard. You know you're Black, you know you're up what you're up against. Uh, and I started off wanting to be a medical, I didn't want to, I was tracked for math and science. And I was like, oh, medicine's going to take too long. Why don't I be a medical technologist? And I had that major for two years until I found out what they did. And I was like, that's a little boring. So I switched to chemistry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm graduating degree in chemistry. And uh, I'm going to take you all back. The only thing instant back then was coffee. Okay. No cell phones. Phones on the wall. Party line. Long court, right? Um, no computers. So we got a recruiting, um, uh, HB Xavier's a historically black college, so this is 1968, so we're at the dawn of integration, forced by law. Same right? year Martin Luther King is assassinated. That's right, forced by law, okay. Um, and so um, we get a, a pamphlet from various corporations with their information on it, and you fill out your resume by hand, and they mail it off. And then I get the notion of these three job offers. So I go to the Louisiana drug industry. Not going to happen. They fly me in for Hoffman and Roach. They fly me into Newark Airport. Anybody can remember what Newark Airport looked like in the 1970s? Not an exciting place to be. Uh, and they pick me up, and I go to Hoffman and La Roche, where everything is white. The buildings, the people, the coats. And then... I go back home, and I get the Polaroid trip. They fly me into Boston. They put me up on Storrow Drive. It's springtime. I have a lovely hotel. When they bring me to Polaroid campus, they bring out some black people. I was like, okay, I'll take this job. It was easy. It seemed easy. And then once I get there, uh, I integrate my lab as a professional. There are other black people around, but they're dishwashers, um, and people clean the glassware. Uh, there are other black professionals, but not in my particular shop. And so I'm in the color labs, mm. which I think is like a little interesting play on words. And um, it's all about color, right? Even in America. 
Um, and my job is to work on the goo. That's the little thing that's the pod that spreads the dye that makes the picture. So we're trying to improve the glue. So we're using the spectrometer, we're running chemical tests that come to us from other places in the company to say to do this. And that job is not satisfying to me. So I go into the black community and I start a kitchen chemistry course mm -hmm. for kids. And then Polaroids puts up an opportunity to do youth motivation and I volunteer for that. Eventually I'm tutoring adults who don't have um, high school diplomas. And that's, I never wanted to be a teacher. But that's very rewarding. And when I was, I was doing that up until the time I was fired. Uh, and when I was fired, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? I don't have a degree anymore. So I go out and get a master's in education and blah, blah, blah. I think it's also just important for audiences to have some context of the corporate culture at the time at Polaroid. Right. Could you talk a little bit about, you've mentioned in our private conversations mm -hmm. about sensitivity training. Yes, 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 uh, yes. What, what was black labor relations like in the context of the Polaroid Corporation. I was also just so struck by how you talk about um, how black employees were forced to turn on against the Polaroid Revolutionary uh, well, Workers Movement. Yes, and we understood that very well because um, it's one thing for you to risk the job. <laughs> it's another thing to risk your whole family's jobs. Mm. And so we understood that the pressure was being applied internally, which was going to make it difficult to us to organize further and for the people who joined us to, to stick with us because they needed those jobs. Mm -hmm. And we realized, we understood the success of the boycott. The Birmingham boycott was stark in our minds, the impact of a boycott. Uh, and we also um, felt that Polaroid had a product that was susceptible to a boycott mm -hmm. because you could support us by not buying it. So we were appealing to the, um, you could say, the moral judgment of people. Um, and what we did was try to present them with the facts of this is what happens because of Polaroid's participation in South Africa. This is what happens to Africans. And at one point, we had a slogan. You remember, you don't have to be Jewish to like rye bread. So we say, you don't have to be black to hate apartheid. You just have to be right thinking. Mm. Could we just have that image of the advertisements? Because I think it also, because we're a space of material culture, maybe double click again and we can right. have the advertisement um, that became a part of the boycott. Could you talk a little bit about how you came up with different designs for the flyers? Mm -hmm. And I'm also just so struck by your stories of handing them out mm -hmm. at the subways or at protests. Um, just so audiences know, Caroline and I had the opportunity to go to the Schomburg Center yesterday, where in Bob Baron Lirawap's papers are some of his own correspondences with Polaroid, as well as some of the other flyers from the Polaroid Corporation. And it was clear that these pamphlets were traveling through people's hands at a time when these mass reproduction technologies did not exist. That's right, that's right. The first one, the crudely lettered one, was on a mimeograph machine. But uh, all of the production is Ken's genius. Uh, he might have showed me something, but this is all his work, his handiwork. Uh, he was a self-taught photographer and a rena renaissance man, really. Uh, and one of the reasons why he was moved to the pho photographic group because he was loading film, film into film-producing machines. And in the meantime, on his breaks, he was taking Polaroid photographs. So he knew if he put it in the snow, he would get a different color. If he put it under his arms, he could warm it up. Um, how he figured that out, I don't know. But word went around Polaroid, there's this black guy taking pictures that are better than the professional photographers. So they moved him up to the photographic group. Um, and... Um, so he designed the leaflets, and we went from crudely lettered stuff to printed material. And we were the original social media people. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. When you first gave one out, people were like, eh. But after they turned into this, people were like, well, what you got today, Ken? And he would stand at the turnpike and get groups of students in cars and say, where are you going? Take these and pass them out where you were. So we created a kind of game of whack-a-mole for Polaroid, because they're trying to contain this in Cambridge. And then getting letters from the Dartmouth Brothers of Tuck Coalition, and letters from California from students, and letters from various people saying, what are you doing in South Africa? We're going to boycott you until you get out of South Africa. This leaflet 
the inside insert was produced by an anti-apartheid group in London. We don't even know them. But through contacts in the anti-apartheid movement, which existed before we joined, they sent us this. And the rest we put together. And this is Polaroid's main advertisement. And of course, usually they say it's like opening a present. But the inside says they Polaroid shoot every South African black. Yes, they did. Mm. Indeed, they did. So just one last question before I turn it over to the audience to ask questions. And we've been asking all of our speakers this question in um, as part of our thinking about blackness and material culture. I was wondering, how do you see blackness through the lens of material culture? Or how should we think about material culture through the lens of blackness? Mm -hmm. I think it has, and I think when you think about this, it has a lot to do with how I started off before. Are you in control of the image? Do you possess the image? Does the image possess you? Mm -hmm. And, and um, while Polaroids may be part of black material culture, here, this is white supremacist culture. This is the culture of control, of power, of holocaust, of apartheid, of oppression. And Polaroid didn't just separate blacks from whites. We go into Vietnam. Now we can separate the Vietnamese from the Vietnamese based on their political position. And we can produce an ID that if you tamper with it, it's going to destroy itself. And you have to have it to live. And then we went on to Massachusetts trying to make welfare recipients have a special one mm -hmm. that Mel King, who was just buried in Boston, stopped. And then you have protests on college campuses, Kent State, South Carolina, where students are killed, and now you're bringing an ID system. And you can take four pictures, one for you, one for school, one for the police, and one for labor. So when you look at the use of Polaroid from my lens, you have no control of the image. Mm. And the image controls you, and the image decides whether you live or die. Mm. So for the social use of Polaroids, yes. I can control my image. No one in the lab has to see it. Um, I have to keep taking it and use the boost button to get the right color because we know, if you don't know, Kodak film and Polaroid film are based on the standards of whiteness, just like AI is now. And you take a picture of black people and white people, you couldn't get, somebody's not coming out. Hmm. So Polaroid had a boost button, and we argued that they road tested their film in South Africa to improve it mm. on us. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we're happy to take a few questions in the remaining minutes of the program. So please feel free to ask a question. Are there questions? I think I've always been. No. <laughs> I just want to thank people for coming out and for having interest. Go ahead, Deborah. Oh, I, I think I can. Oh, sorry. I just to, okay. um, thank you so much. That's it's a, a very, very um, fascinating and dark story, but also inspirational. And it seems like you you really created this whole thing. I um, I remember divestment, you know, from from when I was in college, which was in the eighties. It was still going on. Um, and I just wonder how much of your inspiration for this had to do with the civil rights movement that by 1970 or 1971, you had achieved certain goals and had not to say that it's, you know, obviously it's an ongoing process that's still continuing, but how much of, was there kind of an intersectionality between the civil rights movement as a larger whole and this particular chapter that is, I think largely unknown outside of a small community of people of your protest movement and how you organize this, this sort of mobilize this against Polaroid. Yes, we use the civil rights movement as, a, as an inspiration. Uh, the notion of boycott as a nonviolent effective protest had been shown to us before. So absolutely, we were inspired by that. But I'm in the Malcolm X generation as well, you know, so um, it's still a take no prisoner situation. 
Uh, and we were very clear when we named ourselves that Polaroid had to be in the name for the boycott, that workers had to be in it because that was our agency. We understood it before Hoagland wrote about it. Uh, and we felt we were revolutionary. So we were deliberate in what we did, but we didn't do it alone. Nowadays, young people call it intersectionality. We talked about coalition product, pro coalition building, that if you had an organization, a community organization, you believed in the values of what we did, we'll support you, you'll support us, and we built the coalition. And as I said, we joined an anti-apartheid movement that rallied around us, and then we built it from the ground up. We started asking churches and organizations to divest. We asked students to get involved, and then it grew. I would also add, Caroline, and we've talked about this a little bit, it was also a pivotal moment in which the relationship of African-American activism shifted in relation to Africa. That, I mean, they took on an outside role in helping mobilize forces against these oppressive colonial era governments. So Robert, the work that Robert Van Leerwalk did, as well as you, brings a new chapter or an extension of the history of the civil rights movement and its relationship to Africa into a new dimension. Absolutely. When we went to the UN, um, South Africa, you got to remember, the South Africans were in exile. The South African delegation was the South African delegation of the apartheid government. But the African delegates welcomed us with open arms. They took us to the visitors' lounge. They celebrated our arrival, that here are black Americans. And people said to me, have you been to South Africa? I didn't go to South Africa until 1998. How did you think about this? Ask the ancestors. We are all connected whether we know it or not. And I was raised to, to lead a purpose-given life. If I start talking about my mother, I'll put you to tears. She, la she passed at 101. She last volunteered at 96 years old, okay? She was the simultaneous president of many organizations at the same time. Her obituary was a full column in a full newspaper. And after that, I'm researching her life and I have to do a flow chart to talk about my mother's years of service to go in the community booklet. <laughs> so between her and the ancestors, I don't think I could escape it. Yes. Thank you so much. That was great. It was great also to get all the details you promised us yesterday at yes. lunch. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't you. give you all, but I gave you a lot. Thank but you ask for... another question, I'll give you another one. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so Drew asked you in particular about your own family's mm -hmm. you know, engagement with Polaroid, which you didn't have growing right. up. I'm, I'm interested, as the movement spread mm -hmm. uh, outside of the workers at the corporation right. to various communities and governments and more civil society, um, whether you, what kind of dynamic occurred for people for whom they had loyalty to the brand because their families used it and who, how, how did you engage with people who wanted to support the cause mm -hmm. of divestment and boycott of South Africa, but didn't want to give up their Polaroid? You know, like that dynamic of the people who- You mean the whom, camera they filmed? For whom the technology um, had, had been, played a big role in their family and in sort of uh, everyday life. We want them to do what Dick Gregory did, put it under the bed, don't use it. And we, we you know, it was, uh, it seems like a simple gesture. But we didn't ask you to give anything. We asked you not to do something that would harm somebody. And it turned out to be very effective. So I've known you for a long time, Carol, but there are a lot of things, I'm sorry, <laughs> that I don't know about you. Yes. But um, I was thinking, did you wake up one morning and say, well, I'm going to go out here and lead the charge and be courageous? And I said, well, she's a fearless person. But I don't think you woke up that time. But they, I just finished this book, We Were Made for These Times. And mm -hmm. it talks about your own sense, dealing with your own sense of fear and needing to have the courage. So we, there are a lot of things that I think many of us, most of us, want to do. We say, oh, I'd like to be a part of that. I'd like to support this group or that yeah. group, whether it's the, the earth or systemic racism right. or immigrants or what. But where do I start? How do I get involved with other people? How do I not put my family and my life at risk? What is it that I can do? How do I make those first steps? So do you have any suggestion or counsel about how 
people might take small steps to mm -hmm. lead to larger steps and, and others? Well, I did, I, when I talk to, uh, and I speak to, I'm a former high school educator, but I speak to young people a lot. I did not go to Cambridge to start an international movement. Mm -hmm. I went to be young and wild and free. And I can remember when we said we're going to call a boycott, I'm like, there goes my, I was 23, 24. There goes my youth. But I don't know where the courage came from. It's like when you're backed up against the wall, is it, what do you do? I don't know. I blame the ancestors and my mother. I have no idea where they came from. But I know I was raised to be something more than myself. And that's what, she, which is one of my polar bears. That's what I preach to people in the water. And that's how, unfortunately, I ran for school committee and got on. Uh, because uh, I'm telling people, I tell people, get involved, really. I talk myself into it, it pray for me. Um, but I tell people, get involved. Um, on Martha's Vineyard, you have this retirement community. And I say to people, if you can get to Martha's Vineyard, when you have a birthday party, you don't need gifts. Adopt a charity and give something to somebody else. Hmm. When you go, if you go to a high price place to eat, there's a food pantry and there's some homeless, hungry people on Martha's Vineyard. I watched a woman make her bed last night in front of a corporate space as we went out for dinner. We have homeless and hungry people and hungry children everywhere in this country. So what is it you're going to stand up for? What moves you? And get involved with people who are like-minded. Start small. Start local. But be something more than yourself. Be something to somebody. And that's how I got involved. But it, it wasn't planned to be this way. We'll take, unfortunately, just one more question. And I saw a hand in the back. I'm going to stand because I'm all the way in the back. Thank you, Ms. Hunter, for this really wonderful conversation and presentation. Um, I had a question about archiving and the foresight that you all were working with as you were organizing. What, if any, conversations were you having as you were designing material, sharing them with various communities about preservation and documentation? So that we might find, so that we now find ourselves in 2023 engaging with the material in formal institutions like the Schomburg and elsewhere. Uh, one of the interesting things, and I think it has to do with the training as a scientist, because I'm a scientist by nature, you're kind of fact orientated. Um, for some reason, I collected the media and everything we did. So I have these notebooks of all of our, not all of our work, but a lot of our work. Polar Polaroid had a media company to research everything that was printed about them. I couldn't afford that. So we used to read, part of our success was our ability to learn and understand, uh, and Chris helped us a lot, that the stories that you're told, you get a story reported in the, the New York Times, when you see that story in the International Herald, which goes to the world, it's a different story. When you see that story in the South, the South African Daily Rand is a different story. So we got to be well known at out of town news agencies. They saved the South African papers for us. But that was the way we kept up with the information that we shared with you. So I preserved all of those materials. And the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe has asked for my papers. We're, I haven't responded to them. But we're in negotiations, uh, we'll be in negotiations about them. But I just happened to preserve it. And at one point, Ken and I had this conversation. He says, you got to give the papers to somebody. I say, Ken, we've given everything else away. I'm not giving the papers away. And so I do have them. Some of that archival material is at, in Robert Van Leer's file. But uh, Michigan State has an act, African activist archives. And a lot of my papers are there. And oftentimes, that's the way people find me, because they go to Michigan to find the papers, and they come and find me. Uh, just for you, I had one researcher who came from Argentina. I'm chapter seven in her dissertation. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, because it's in Spanish, and it's hard to get that material here. But she said to me, she had stalked me for seven years until I finally put up a Facebook page. And she said to me, and this is a question for history to answer, why are you a hidden figure in the anti-apartheid movement? Why do we know about the men? I said, you have to ask the men. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you.